So welcome back, everyone. We are going to have now the last of our Fermium Quantum Monte Carlo talks by Johannes Hoffman. He's going to be talking about stabilization, global updates, um, and give examples. So the word's yours. Thank you, Jefferson, for the introduction. And yes. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, your audio is kind of lo uh, low. Sorry? Is it better? Yeah. Mm, slightly, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does this make a difference? Mm, I think it did, yeah. Sorry? I think it did. All right. Yeah, it's good. Okay, thanks. Uh, Yes, there you go. Okay, as uh, Jefferson already mentioned, I will be talking about stabilization and explain why we need uh, that and how we do this. Uh, mention a few uh, options for global updates, uh, focusing then uh, particularly on Lorschwa dynamics. And in the end, I will also be giving a few examples and a list of supported codes before then in the last like 10, 15 minutes, Fakir will continue with the presentation of the projects for the workshop. Okay, so stabilization, what is it and why do we need this? Uh, as we have seen yesterday and the day before, central quantities of the algorithm are the propagators in imaginary time, which is the product of those B matrices, which by themselves are product of the exponentiated interaction uh, vertices and the hopping matrix. And then we use those B matrices to calculate the Green's functions. And as you can pretty easily imagine, if you multiply very many exponentiated operators where the eigenvalue spectrum is typically positive and negative, just think about the hopping where you have conduction and valence bands, then you're mixing exponentially large and small scales. And to do this properly, you have to worry about numerical stabilization. And this time I would like to use more of a notebook. And I hope that you can see the product of BL to B1. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yes. So. Let me first derive a uh, visual image of what this means. And instead of multiplying the product of this B1 or BL to B1, um, just as it is, allow me to add, sorry, wrong color, uh, to multiply this by the identity, which obviously doesn't do much. Um, but now I can work on the uh, visualization of what this means. And I write this as B1, uh, where I have one zero zero zero, and then another entry uh, somewhere down the line. So I have the ones on the identity, but the point is that I can now interpret a column as one basis vector or the nth column as the nth basis vector, which I refer to here as E. And what happens if I multiply matrices to a vector? Well, in general, I can rotate the vector if it was unitary so that it's a, a norm and angle preserving, that's all I can do. But in these B matrices, we have E to the minus delta tau some coupling G for the interaction vertex vi, but we also have e to the minus delta tau times the hopping. The hopping typically is real, so this part uh, certainly is not a unitary and we are allowed to change angles and the norm or the length of a vector. While it depends on what g is, g often is the square root of Okay, in this case, I have the minus delta tau in here, but uh, it's the square root of a number in many cases, and then it can be imaginary or real depending on the sign. So overall, if I now imagine my BL, B1 multiplied to 
a set of vectors where one vector is E1, while another vector is E2, then the result is typically a vector that got rotated, so E1 prime, and another vector, sorry, what's happening? And then another vector uh, E2 prime. <clears throat> and one of the issues here that can arise is that since I'm not preserving angles and lengths, is that E prime, E1 prime can become very, very uh, similar to E2 prime, maybe up to the length. In particular, if the angle between those is getting smaller and smaller. So potentially I can find, or I can generate columns that are almost linearly dependent from each other. And this is a, summarized here again, and this will cause a problem because if I have linearly dependent or at least a numerical position linearly dependent uh, columns in a matrix, I know that the determinant vanishes. Uh, and we use the determinant, for example, to calculate the um, weight of a configuration, and then we are in trouble. And we also needed this to calculate the Green's function. So even if vectors are almost linear dependent, we still have to be able to resolve the small angle between them. And there is a solution for doing this. And this is called the Gram-Schmidt decomposition, or also known, or a technique that we use along the way is the householder reflections. Uh, for those who, of you who do numerics, you might already have a guess on where this is going. Um, the idea of how we disentangle now these rotated and stretched and squeezed um, basis vectors E1 to En or E1 prime to En prime is that we first look for the largest vector that we generated. So let's assume this was E1 prime and then we define a new basis, the tilde basis, uh, as uh, where the first vector of this basis points into the direction of E1 prime. Now, if we want to generate the other basis vectors for E2 tilde, for example, we now look at the second longest or largest eigenvector or prime vector that we generated. So we take E1, sorry, E2 prime, but now we really want this vector to be orthogonal to the previous set of uh, eigenvectors or basis vectors. In this case, it's only this E1, E1 tilde. So we subtract the portion of this that points in the direction of E1 tilde. And to do so, we have to take the norm of how much overlap there actually is between, this is not E tilde here, but E prime, E1 tilde. And this has to be normalized at this stage. I'm not assuming yet that the basis vectors are normalized. E1 tilde. And I can continue this for the rest of the basis vectors where I substant sequentially always sub subtract the portion of a vector that points into the direction that we already have in our basis and re-orthogonalize the basis. Um, so what we end up with is a matrix, let me call this U, which essentially contains E1 tilde, E2 tilde, E3 tilde, and so on and so forth, where I explicitly now normalize this by the square root of E1 tilde, E1 tilde. I will write it only once, but all of them are divided by their norm so that I know these are uh, unit vectors that give a specific direction. And of course, we also, in some cases, and I will explain later, 
in which cases we will also have to include the mixing of the scales. Uh, that is to say the overlap that we had to subtract when we orthogonalized them. So using this technique, we can rewrite this product of BL to B1 as a UDV decomposition, where this U matrix really knows about the direction of the generated vectors by the product of all these B1s to BLs. This D matrix contains the length of the vectors that we have generated, so the norm of the vectors that we take care of when we normalize them to put them in U, while V knows about the mixing of those uh, scales or of the vectors, how they were rotated in relative position to each other. <clears throat> so this for, was now done for one time step or for one sequence of those B matrices. But um, in the Monte Carlo, we will have to multiply L trot of those B matrices. Um, and to this end, let's assume we are looking now at the product from one to BL. So there will be BL plus one and then BL all the way to B1. I already have done a UDV decomposition of the tail, the part from BL to B1 and write this as U1, D1, B1, simply because it's the first UDV decomposition that I have uh, performed. Now I can calculate the product of B2L to BL plus one, but I'm acting only on this UL. And you can again think of this UL as a set of basis vectors which is just not the uh, usual um, X, Y, Z and so on direction, but it is already rotated due to the product of BL to D1. And then performing yet again, a UDV decomposition of this term, I get a U2, a D2, which contains the scales of the vectors after the second rotation, sorry, I made one slight mistake because we actually do include the scales of those vectors in this rotation. And then V, I'm not calling it V2 yet because we have this trailing V2, which contains the mixing from the, sorry, the trailing V1, which contains the mixing from the first UDV decomposition and then the product of V and B1 will be V2. So that is to say, if we now have our imaginary time axis from zero to beta with our L trot or trotter decomposition step sizes, then after L, after 2L, 3L and so on, we always perform these UDV decompositions to stabilize the product of those matrices. Uh, and this is the parameter, which in the Monte Carlo call, uh, shows up as n rep. This is the number of time slices that we allow for the propagation before we have to reorthogonalize the scales generated by B. Are there any questions for this part? Okay, then assuming that everything was crystal clear, the next step is we will have to calculate Green's functions. So we will have to calculate the Green's function uh, for the finite temperature where we have one plus the product of those B matrices from tau to one times the product of BL trot to BL tau plus one, and then the inverse of it. And for the projective code, as was shown yesterday by Emily, the Green's function is given as 
one minus um, I introduce the B larger, uh, which is written down here, and I'll explain it in a second, times uh, the inverse of B smaller B larger times then B smaller in the end. So the inversion happens at a slightly different place. And B larger, or you could also view this as uh, B cat, is the sequence of B tau to B1 applied to your trial wave function. Um, and in this bra cat formulism of those trial wave functions, this would be a cat vector, hence the name and the shape of the symbol. Um, and using the same ideas of the UDVD compositions that I just explained, I will then be assuming that this product can be decomposed into, or is already decomposed into UDV, where each of the components carry the uh, angle according to the cat or the bra. Uh, and the bra is the same, almost the same, I should say. And if you think about a trial wave function as a bra vector, then you have essentially a tall matrix where the column contains the wave function for the first particle. So this would be essentially psi of the first particle. And you have, should probably roll down a little bit. You have n part particles in the trial wave function but the wave function itself could be anywhere on the lattice. So this would be ending irrelevant fermionic degrees of freedom. And this doesn't have to be the same. In particular, if it was the same, you would have every particle filled. That's a pretty boring state and nothing can happen there. <clears throat> but then for the cat, on the other hand, so this was for uh, essentially you, uh, no, this was for the cat state, uh, while for the bra state, it's a uh, matrix where the wave functions appear in their rows. So this is just the other way around. And then it is more useful not to do the UDV decomposition where one uh, focuses on the columns, but rather on the rows, which means I take complex conjugate first to UDV and turn it back. And this is why the ordering here is different. I start with V, D, U instead of uh, U, D, V. Okay, so the task is now to calculate the Green's function. And let me take care of the projective uh, co-version first. So what I have to calculate is one minus, and now there will be a sequence of UDVs and VDUs. So we start with the cat, which is UDV. Then we have a VDU, UDV inverse VDU. And we had bra, cat, 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 bra, 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 and so on. So this is simply using this equation and those two relationships of the UDV decomposition. And note that the trial wave functions were tall or wide matrices. This also applies to you to the two U's. So this one is a tall matrix, well, this is a white matrix and hence they are not invertible because it's not a square matrix. While the other matrices can be treated as square matrices and are invertible. And this means I can use that a B inverse is equal to B inverse A inverse, given that A and B are invertible. So this V here shows up as a V inverse and then D inverse. Now I have U V 
and then D <clears throat> D inverse D inverse. This was the inverse part in the middle. And then we also have the V D U on the sides. And here it's U D V. And of course, there's the one minus up front. And you can see that now this V is exactly inverted by this part. So combined, it's just the identity. Then similar for the scales of the UDV decomposition for D. And also the same happens on this side. So this is one of the big advantages of the projective code that the mixing of those wave functions that you now can really interpret as the single particle wave functions of your Slater determinant trial state, uh, they don't matter. They drop out at the moment where you calculate the Green's function, which determines the dynamics of the algorithm. So what you're really worried about only is the wave function or the Slater determinant state. Um, and at this state stage, uh, it's easy and stable to calculate um, this expression for ortho normalized basis states in U and V. <clears throat> the only thing uh, why you still need stabilization for a projective method is uh, I still have to resolve angles between tri wave function when I do the UDV. So it must not be linear, look as if it was linearly dependent. Right. Um, now, for the finite temperature Green's function, so now we move on to finite temperature. I don't want to go to all the details because this can actually get quite tricky because you can use ideas of where the scales are larger and smaller. But what I want to say is, I think I have to scroll up a tiny bit. Um, so I will have U R D R U R D R V R V L D L U L, and I have want to calculate the inverse of this. I'm using the same trick that I can pull this UR out as the inverse on the left. So I could write UR dagger at this stage and drop it here. Uh, but for me to be able to do so, I hope I'm not getting the signs confused. I have to write this uh, identity as UR U R dagger. I'm using the fact that uh, U's are unitary, and if I inverse, it's the same as taking the adjoint. So at the expense of pulling this U out, I leave a U R dagger in place of the one. And then I can do the same with the left-hand side so that the Greens function reads U L dagger. Um, U R dagger U L dagger plus D R V R V L D L U R dagger. And the whole point is now I was able to shuffle some of the scales uh, that I initially had on this side here to the one, so that one term of the sum can always act as a regulator from the other side. On a piece of paper, this looks equivalent. If you do the numerics, it's way more stable to perform yet one last UDV decomposition here before we then actually take the inverse. All right, so this is the, re the explanation of what numerical stabilization, why we have to do numerical stabilization 
and how this is done in the end. Uh, do you have any questions to this part? Let me just um, summarize this on the slide. Again, BL to B1 rotates these matrices. We use Gram Schmidt to reorthogonalize them. We keep the scale separated uh, until we calculate the Green's function. And the difference of the old and the new Green's function is reported in info. Any questions here? All right. So this will wrap up the stabilization. Now, let me talk about global updates. Um, we have, in principle, two different uh, types of global updates. There's one type where we can do global updates on um, a single time slice, where we just change multiple fields uh, either auxiliary fields from Hubbard's Sotonovich transformations or bosonic degrees of freedom. But in any case, it's on a single time slice. Uh, these moves are a little bit more expensive in CPU time compared to the sing sequential single spin flip, but it's still kind of okay since we are on a single time slice. Additionally, one can also do changes on multiple time slices for multi multi multiple uh, times. And then you have a proper global move. The difficulty or odd, as Fakia mentioned, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, is how do we find a good update? So assume you know little about the fields and what's good and what's bad, and just say, you know, we have four fields, let's assume on average, maybe the move gets accepted with 50% for a single spin flip that I change. And if I can't incorporate the correlations between those fields and I just propose random updates of many fields at the same time, then the expectation or the, the average acceptance will go down exponentially with the number of fields that I change. So it is really extremely critical to find good updates and mimic the correlations between the fields as good as possible so that the move that I propose is actually accepted when I calculate the relative weight between the old configuration and then the new configuration. There are ways of how one can do this a famous example is probably the Wolf algorithm, which is partic working particularly well if one has uh, Ising degrees of freedoms coupled to fermions at weak coupling, uh, because the Wolf algorithm can uh, account for the coupling of the Ising fields. And then you hope that the fermion determinant doesn't interfere with the interact or acceptance too much so that one is still um, able to accept the moves reasonably often. In general, even though I don't think that any of us in Würzburg or Würzburg affiliated tried this, uh, but one could also train uh, neural networks to learn these correlations and then use those uh, to propose good updates or you know, can also be creative and maybe come up with a better scheme and find ways. What I want to discuss in a little bit more detail is the Langevin dynamics. <clears throat> okay, so the idea of Langevin is that you introduce an additional artificial time uh, referred to as Langevin time and then one samples the fields not by doing single spin flips or just choosing uh, maybe intelligently more or less at least global fields to update them, but instead you integrate a stochastic differential equation. So the field, the, the uh, small s in bold represents the collection of all of the fields 
together in one vector. And I'm updating the field on one Lorschwa time slice uh, to the fields on the next neighboring Lorschwa time slice, a step delta tau Lorschwa apart, by calculating the derivative of the action uh, plus the square root of delta tau with a random field eta. Uh, I left Q in here for some for comparison to the documentation, but just treat it as the identity for now. It can be used to accelerate uh, the fields, so to make slow modes fast and fast modes slower, but I don't want to discuss this part at this stage. Uh, the stochastic fields, however, they are centered around zero and all of them are independent. So there's no correlation in those fields uh, in uh, vertex index, in imaginary time or in Lorschwa time. And you can think of these stochastic fields as representing the quantum fluctuations around the subtle point that you would get if you just did gradient descent to the, with respect to the action. Uh, and the claim is that integrating this or updating the fields in this fashion will represent configurations with the correct weight, at least in the limit where the Lorschwa step size is going to zero. But why is this, this the case? <clears throat> so assume we knew the distributions of the fields on a given Lorschwa time. This is the P, I hope you can see my cursor. If not, please somebody complain. Uh, there is this P of S prime and tau L in the center of this equation, uh, which is the distribution of the fields S prime uh, at Lorschwa time tau L. And then I have to know how the new field S after a time slice uh, can be generated out of the S primes that I originally had on the old time slice. Uh, and this is the Stelter function and I'm averaging over the stochastic field. And with a little bit of, um, um, how do you say, like manipulations of this integral, partial integrations, you can reduce this to the Blocker function to a Fokker-Planck equation, where the derivative with Lorschwa time of this probability distribution is related to the derivative with respect to the fields of the distribution times the derivative with the action, plus, this is essentially originating from this term, plus uh, Q times the derivative of the probability with respect to S. And I guess it's just looking at this solution here once that you can see assuming, or looking at the stationary solution. Stationary means that the derivative was, or, or it doesn't change as a function of Lorschmann time. So the left-hand side will vanish. And for the left-hand side to vanish, the right-hand side also has to vanish. And this is the case when the derivative of the probability distribution cancels or is related to the derivative of the action. And this is solved by exactly this expression here, which we know very well is the probability of the configurations in the Monte Carlo. Okay, so this is almost the last part of the Norshma updates. And you might want to convince yourself that this actually works. So you can look at the energy as an expectation value generated by this Norshma updating scheme as a function of the Norshma step size. And this here nicely falls on a straight line and extrapolates to the correct value. So, This would be um, concluding the Lorschwa updates. And it's typical if you look at the small delta tau steps, delta TL steps, that you have more noise because of the square root 
in front of the differential equation, the Gaussian fluctuations of these eta fields become more prominent. Uh, okay, let me quickly check the time. Yeah. So this would wrap up the global updates. Any questions so far? All right. Then let me use the last uh, 10 minutes before I hand over to Fakir to summarize and give a few examples of uh, models that we can solve. So you have seen it before, uh, for example, in Florian's talks. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian with all its terms combined. There is the kinetic part where you have the fermionic coupling terms. Um, you, it's uh, assumed to be, uh, sorry, this was one click too much. It's assumed to be blocked diagonal in the uh, flavor index, so in, in S and in sigma, uh, the color index. The difference is though that the matrix may depend explicitly on S, not as a matrix, so it's still S instead of S and S prime, uh, but it may depend on S, so that the different flavors don't have to be identical while the different uh, colors have to be identical so that we can exploit an SUN symmetry in the end. And then similar uh, rules hold for the part potential term. Here's the part with the perfect squares, where again, you have the sum over the color index sigma and flavor index S. Uh, important to note that it's uh, within the parentheses that get squared. Uh, and again, the matrix uh, may depend on S, but not on sigma for the SUN symmetry. And finally, you have the coupling of Ising fields or continuous fields to the fermionic part where those degrees of freedom can have their own dynamics. <clears throat> and each of these matrix T, V, and I have to be Hermitian. So to make this more concrete, and it's not necessarily clear that there is only a unique version of formulating uh, things. Uh, let's take a look at the SUN Hubbard model on a square lattice. So the first term is, of course, the well-known hopping between nearest neighbor sites. And then you have the density interaction as the density minus one. So we are looking at fluctuations around half filling that are squared. And this is one formulation how we can use this. Uh, the number and dim, the number of fermionic degrees of freedom in this case would be equal to the number of lattice sites. The number of flavors is one because we do have a formula formalism where nothing depends on spin and we can use spin as the SU2 symmetry and therefore n color is n. And uh, in this formulation, there is no checkerboard decomposition. So the number of hopping matrices is one. The interaction strength is U divided by N. So just compare the U, UK in the first line with the U over N here. We have an interaction vertex on each lattice side, which is extremely sparse in the sense that only the case term, which here is I, actually has a non-zero uh, matrix zero. At the same time, I could also rewrite the Hubbard model uh, with the sign change in front of the interaction. And then I don't take the density, but the SC value squared. Okay, it's not quite SC because I didn't divide by two. Mm. Right. And in this case, now the sign changes if I look at this. It's diagonal in spin because it's again C dagger up, C up, but no up down flipping terms. However, the prefactor for the spin up is plus one while the prefactor of the spin down is minus one. So the condition that the matrix may not depend on sigma doesn't apply for the spin. So now we interpret the spins as flavors 
which means the SUN color index is one, where we have two different flavors, namely the spin up and spin down. <clears throat> yeah. And since it came up a bunch during various discussions, I would also want to show the formulation of the extended Hubbard model. And I think compared to the discussion just like about an hour ago, I have chosen a different normalization when I introduce V. So don't worry about the uh, U minus four V compared to U minus two V here compared to the two minus four V from before. And the interaction reads the Hubbard interaction where positive U's uh, prefer single occupied sites. So this is the repulsive Hubbard model and then nearest neighbor density interaction. And I can rewrite this density between I and J as density I plus or minus, depending on the sign of V, the density of uh, N J minus one, and then the whole term is squared. So simply by multiplying the square out, you get the mixed term, which is uh, two times N I minus one times the sine of V times NJ minus one. So the two cancels and the sine V with the absolute value of V up front is exactly the density interaction. Uh, but you get additional terms. And the additional term is that you also have a square uh, of the densities in the V part. So you have to choose an effective U, which in this case, uh, since part of the total Hubbard interaction that we want is originating from those bonds, uh, we have to reduce the effective U uh, by 2V. Um, the two is actually a four by two where the four is from the four bond directions and the other one half is explicitly here up front. Uh, and we can simulate this as long as the effective U remains repulsive. Uh, because in this case, we can then use particle hole symmetry uh, to guarantee the absence of the sign problem. As soon as this would flip the sign, we can't use particle hole or time reversal and we would suffer from the sign problem. And there were also quite a few questions about, is it restrictive if you are limited to perfect squares? So this is supposed to serve as an example. If you're creative enough, you can often find a basis where you can rewrite the interaction in terms of perfect squares. So we have nearest neighbor as, so we are looking at the frustrated condo lattice model um, where we have SC interactions between neighboring sites. Okay, it depends on which I and J are non-zero for this matrix. And you also have spin flip terms uh, between neighboring sites. The fermions have their usual hopping part and the Hubbard interaction. And then you have a condo coupling where you condo couple the spin C dagger sigma C or sigma plus minus C to the spin of the uh, local moments. And this looks nothing like a perfect square, but if you choose the right basis and work a little bit, then you can uh, fermionize the spins uh, and write this interaction actually in perfect squares. Uh, the Hubbard interaction is another example, is, uh, uh, sorry, not the Hubbard interaction, the condo interaction as another example can be written as the square of uh, conduction uh, electrons hopping to F electrons, the fermionized electrons of the spins. Uh, so even Hamiltonians, which don't look like perfect squares in the beginning, can often be rewritten in a way so that I can in general handle it. <clears throat> so let me just flash the supported codes that we have. There is on one hand the SUN symmetric Hubbard model where you have local density at on-site density interaction uh, with an SUN symmetric uh, degree of freedom for the fermions. 
Similarly, you can have the TV model where you are still allowed, where you have nearest neighbor fermion hopping and nearest neighbor density interaction. Uh, one can also study long range density interactions or convolutus models. And this in general can be done on quite a few different lattices. There's the square lattice or the uh, bilayer square lattice, which comes in very nice if you study condo models where you can interpret one layer as the condo uh, F electron layer and the other one is the conduction ones. The n leg letters you have seen in the tutorials or the honeycomb both as a single or bilayer version. And then to some extent, we also have uh, C2 lattice gauge theories coupled to fermion matter. Uh, but as far as I understand, this is only implemented for the square lattice. And due to the dynamics of those C2 fields, it's more challenging to come up with a symmetric proto decomposition. And with this, I would conclude the examples and support it uh, session, code session, which concludes the uh, discussion here in general. And after taking some questions, I will hand over to Fakir for the project proposals. I hope I stayed in time enough for you, Fakir. Thank you, Hannes. There any questions? Um, yes, so I just have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you go back to the slide where you showed the Hamiltonian for the condo model? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so for, for, the, for the spin part, uh, you know, when we do a, this part on construction for spin models, we have to impose uh, one, one fermion per site, right? Yes. And usually people do it either with uh, uh, like a site dependent uh, chemical potential. But in your case, so I just want to make sure within ALF, the right way to do it is to introduce a site propulsion and take it to infinity, something like that. Precisely. Yes. Okay. Very good catch. Uh, I was skipping over this part. Yes. If I fermionize the spins, I have to uh, actually constrain them so that I'm stuck with one particle per site. Otherwise, I also have charge fluctuations, which were not part before. Um, in this term, you have, uh, or in this uh, QMC implementation, you have an explicit repulsive uh, Hubbard interaction for the F electrons, which uh, does exactly this. Even though, to be honest, I also smuggled in a particle hole transformation for the spin down. So the attract repulsive Hubbard interaction is mapped to an attractive interaction. Okay. okay. Uh, but this is really a, a minor side, side uh, comment. Uh, and there is another fact that we can use here, and that is that uh, the rest of the Hamiltonian is preserving the charge uh, per site of the F electrons. So if I look at the fermion part, uh, I couple the F electrons only via spin. But if I change the spin orientation on F electron side, I don't change the charge there. Uh, and that is to say that the Hubbard interaction commutes with the rest of the Hamiltonian. So the projection onto the, and, and therefore the local parity is a preserved quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the projection onto the single occupied site required to fulfill the constraint works very efficiently. Okay, okay. Good, thanks. You're welcome. Right. I don't seem to be more questions, so I will handing over to you, Faka. Okay. So I hope can you see my iPad? Yes. No? Correct? You can see that? 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, so um, the, mod, the 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 projects. Let me quickly summarize what we we went through yesterday. Um, one. So the Hubbard the Hubbard model on n leg ladders, n leg la ladders. So that's a surprise if you want from one to two D. And this is checking this beautiful article. And then uh, uh, the emergent symmetries of the one dimensional um, Heisenberg model, or actually. What you would do here is uh, simulate the one-dimensional Hubbard model and then calculate spin-spin correlations, also dimer-dimer correlations. This is programmed, this is pre-programmed, and you should see that they have exactly the same asymptotics. Um, and uh, this will tell you that the Heisenberg model is actually um, the fixed point of the Heisenberg model. It's a critical state, is a, is a field theory that was put forward by, by Affleck. Um, and how they, and I think uh, that it's an O4 nonlinear symbol model with Western, you know, which in turn. So that, that's, that's, that's very nice to check this. It's, it's actually not trivial, not a trivial result. Uh, then um, SUN Hubbard model. So Johannes talked about how to go to the SUN Hubbard model. You just take, you just essentially, it, it's amazing that in the ALF, you pay essentially no price and you just change N SUN is equal to two to n SUN equals four. And then you have a completely new physics because there will be a phase transition between SU2 and SU4. You will go from you know, the Heisenberg model or the Hubbard model with a, with, with a critical state to uh, at n equals four, it's basically a symmetry broken state. It's a dimerized state. Um, so this is, this is a, you know, the, the n essentially comes for free. And that's because of this SUN symmetry. Essentially what happens is that if you have the, this would be the action for the SU2, that for the N SUN is equal to two, that would be N SUN. That's how we write it. And then if you go to N SUN is equal to four, um, what the code does is it does exactly the same thing, but it just puts a two in front here. That's it, right? That, that's all there is to it. So it, it's, um, it's, um, it's, it comes for free. Good. So um, an, the other thing was also um, try to, try to come up with a, um, the strong coupling of the SU4 Hubbard model, and it will be an SUN um, um, Heisenberg model in a given representation here. And if you inspire yourself from the condo lattice, which is in the textbook, in, which is in the documentation, you will understand how to, how to do that. Um, but just doing this is already very, very nice and everything's already programmed. Then uh, dynamics, you know, check. This is, an, this is an occasion for you to check Maxent and so that every time when somebody says Maxent, don't use it, then you, you will be able to understand yes or no. Is the person right or not? No, there's a lot of blah, blah around Maxent and uh, which, uh, which is sometimes justified, sometimes not. So it's, it's a tool which we know, which is a bit tricky, but what you should know how to use. So this is the idea, do Maxent, run the simulation, carry out, get the, the, the result, the controlled results on the imaginary time axis, then do the VIC, rotation with Maxent and compare with some DMRG or et cetera. Okay. Now then topological insulators, correlations effects in topological insulators. Um, this was, um, this is essentially this and this, um, uh, the Dirac and the Dirac quantum spin hall is essentially this, the cane Mille model, but um, um, on a square lattice instead on a pi flux lattice instead as on the, um, on a honeycomb lattice, uh, why, I, I don't know why, just, just I, because I, I wanted to do it this way for, this, for these notes. And then you can put in an attractive Hubbard model here, an attractive U, you can dope it. If the U is attractive, then you have no sign problem because of time reversal symmetry. And you can play with this and really, you know, um, you know this is, there's a lot to do here, right? I mean, it's, uh, you can play with edge states. This is the second point, you can play with edge states, you can play with, you know, correlation effects and topological insulators, blah, 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 right? So there's a lot to do. Uh, and you have to ask Johannes because he's been working on this um, um, with Erez in the background. Okay, so, and then of course, there's also um, the edge states, right? So one question was, how do I know if I have topology? Well, you can also just do a simulation with open boundary conditions and then you should see an edge state popping up and that is also good enough. So this is, this is what we talked about yesterday. And um, I hope that it's, uh, these are interesting problems, maybe, maybe sometimes a bit involved. I don't know exactly what your level is, uh, but these are really very nice problems which are feasible uh, with the ALF and which would, uh, 
not require too much. In certain, certain sense, in certain cases, don't require any program. Okay, so now let's go on. Um, today, not so many questions, so I'll go on. So now this is the sticking issues. And the, we, did, we discussed a lot about this already. Um, and this is um, the, the, to um, look at the attractive Harvard model um, a, at finite doping, right? And um, so, in, and for this, you can consider two types of Hubbard Zoltanovich transformation. This one, which couples to the magnetization, or this one, if you write it like this and you, you do, you, you decompose the perfect square, this couples to the density. And now for the, for the attractive Hubbard model, um, then if the U is very big, then you generate those hardcore bosons and those hardcore bosons, they move very slowly. Right? So, so the charge is a very slow degree of freedom. And what you will see is that if you um, decouple along with this along this channel, then the field uh, couples to the the field is essentially the charge. The charge is very slow, and then you will see very long autocorrelation time. Um, if you have those hardcore bosons, right, then you have the you have a spin gap. If you have a gap in it, and you have a gap that means that the field is quick, that the motion is, is is quick, and so the spin dynamics here is rather quick. And the intuition is that if you couple them to the spin, right, then the field should move quickly and you should, be, you should have less autocorrelation time. And this is exactly what will happen if you try this out and have away from half filling. This is a nice, this is a really nice um, check. And I, I, I think when I would suggest this for anybody who wants to start with the Monte Carlo, because it gives you, a, you know, you will have to ask yourself the question of, what are the autocorrelation times to be, to be sure that you do statistics in a nice way, a nice and correct way. So you have to cope in the, in the section four of the documentation, there is a chapter on autocorrelation times, et cetera. Plot the autocorrelation times as in units of sweeps, for example, and see that this does badly and this does well. So there's one more, one more point before we go on here is that um, it's interesting, U is negative, right? So if I, if I, um, so I hope I get this right. I take the absolute value, so this becomes positive. Now, if I want to do a Herbert Sotonovich of this, I will get an E of minus delta tau, um, U divided by two, and then NI up minus NI down um, squared. And so if I do the, if I use our if we use our our, our, our Herbert Sotonovich, essentially what we will get is it because of the minus here, we'll get an I and the square root. So I, I'm sorry, there's an absolute value of U. And then uh, delta tau absolute value of u, and then a field phi, let, let it be continuous, I don't really care here, and then ni up minus ni down, okay? So you would say, oopla, there's an i here, but that essentially, that doesn't pose a problem because of time reversal symmetry. If you have time, time reversal symmetry is an anti-unitary transformation, this is the z component of spin, so the z goes to minus, under time reversal symmetry, this gets a minus, right? But this is because it's an um, anti-unitary transformation, the i goes to minus, so the both minuses, they cancel out, and then you will have no sign problem. And that is also at finite dopings. Even if you put a chemical potential, the chemical potential, that is of course something, ni up plus ni down, that is something of course that is time reversal symmetry. So you can use the time reversal symmetry, which was touched upon by Emily yesterday, to show quickly that here you have no, you actually have no sign problem, even if you decouple in sort of the wrong channel, okay? So that is a that that's I think um, a very interesting technical project. Then here this project are phase transitions. Huh? So the two types of you know you know known phase transitions. This phase transition is essentially take the pi flux model. So you essentially have Dirac electrons. You have Dirac electrons like this. So Dirac's basically you would have two cones or you know, two four flavored cones. You can do that for the maybe for the spinless TV model or for the spinful TV model. And um, the question is how to, uh, if you put in a, a V term, basically the V term is the, the, the V term, it, basically what it will do is it will generate a CDW, a charge, a charge density wave. The charge density wave is a mass term for those DRACs. So essentially what you will get, let me just take one cone, that will be enough, that will, because it's a Q equals zero transition. So you don't really care about the other cone. I just have to get rid of it, okay. So um, if as a function of V, then you will have a transition where you have Dirac fermion and you will open up a gap like this. And this is basically um, mass generation, dynamical mass generation. 
um, it's related to symmetry breaking. The symmetry breaking here that you will have is a Z2 symmetry breaking characterizing the CDW. So these phase transitions are, are, have been studied, I think, over and over again. Um, the only methods that can, can study those phase transitions are really fermionic methods because the fermions are participate in the low energy physics, right? So you cannot, you cannot do anything if you, um, if you don't have the fermion, right? It's, it's not a bosonic, it's not a boson pusher. Okay, just interrupt if there's something which is too quick enough. So these are these are nice. Um, these are very nice um, uh, uh, things to do. For I think that Emily is the one. Correct me if I'm wrong, you Emily, but you're the one who still has the best exponents for that. I guess is that correct, Emily? But you may not say no. I think you, you want. To <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I think yeah. so. <laughs> best exponents for this because you have the biggest system size. Anyway, so this is a this is um, um, Grosneveu transition. Right? That, that's a very special type of, well, it's a, it's a fermionic transition. What you can also do is um, condo. So Johannes talked about condo. Um, and um, essentially the condo, um, condo physics has competition between RKKY and condo screening. And this leads to, so, so what the proposal is here is to, uh, is to look at a, the bilayer condo model, the bilayer square lattice, put the condo model on this bilayer square lattice. And as a function of JK, basically what you will see is that you always have an insulator. So you have, you can, you can uh, measure the single particle gap, the single particle gap, and that will be, um, that will be something which will be proportional to JK. And then you can see that you can look at the magnetization and you will see that there is an order disorder transition, right? So here you would have the magnetization this would be the magnetic ordering. So magnetic ordering. And here you would then have a spin gap, which opens. So this is a single particle gap, SP, and this is a spin gap. So this is a, this is a order disorder transition. Um, and since the charge is gapped, because here I have um, a gap to all the charges, it's a, it's a transition which belongs to the O3, right? A three-dimensional O3, 3D universality class. Right? And so um, this is another example where you can use the off to generate, um, well, first of all, to see that this is a phase transition which happens in the condo model. And then you can even start and uh, think about looking at if the exponents which you have here match the O3 3D universality class. These exponents are known extremely well. These exponents are, even if Emily did a great job, they are still not known at the same level of precision as, as this case, because this would be just something classical. Okay, so this is, this, this slide is for people who are interested in phase transitions. You can, you can generate two types of very different phase transitions, one fermionic, one bosonic. Just, you know, the first thing I would do, which would be enough is to, to check, can you see this phase and this phase? Can you see this phase and this phase? Persuade yourself that you know how to, how, what to do to see the phases. Once you've done this, then you have to, then you can progress if you want and try to understand how to look at criticality, which is a level higher. But just getting the phase is already pretty nice, I think. Okay. And then the 10, that was the, the question, the Jalodinsky Maria. So I never tried this, but the, this is the this is a possibility of how you want to do it, um, how you could do it. And um, so um, so this is the this is the model which uh, somebody sent to me, right? So who sent the model to me in the Discord, the paper? I think that would be me. Yes, so okay. you is, what's your name? I forgot. Me is Andreas Hallam. Yes, exactly. Ah, that's you again. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Very good. So this is, this is, the, this is, this is the model I, I found in the Discord channel. And, and so it's, it's actually pretty easy to, to formulate. So, um, so the first step is to how, what to do with this. This is for us rather easy. I can write it down after if you want. And then essentially what we will do is to play a trick, which is uh, um, use the fact that for SU2, um, spin matrices that basically S of I, any component squared is equal to a fourth, right? You don't, you know, the spin one half squared is equal to, 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 to one, right? Essentially, but that only works for spin one half, right? Um, and you have no charge fluctuation, don't forget. So, so this would be, so this, if I square, if I square this, then I will exactly get this Jalouskinsky Maria term. And I have a sum over alpha, beta, gamma, uh, there's a repeat, you know, beta, some of beta, some of the gamma, one, two, three, et cetera. So this is an identity, 
And um, so, so now that you have written this in this way, you can start to fermionize things. You can start to fermionize things, as was said before. Um, the, so I, I do, a, or the, the word was, we call this fermionization, it's a parton construction. These are, are spin-ons, these are just different words for the same thing. Um, and so you write my spin like this. And of course, this is only okay if we have the, if we have the constraint and we will put in the constraint with the Hubbard U. So um, um, it turns out that this, um, um, you would, to, to do the simulation, uh, what you still have to do is to write down um, this, this term. And this term, what you can do, because it's a SU2 spin dot spin, you can show that, I hope I get it right, that the J S of I S of J is equal to minus J divided by two. So there is a, what I call a D of IJ, D of J, IJ of plus Hermitian conjugate. Um, I hope that I get the, the minuses and everything. Just check it. There's a constant, right? But that should be okay. And then uh, with the D of D dagger of IJ is equal to basically the hopping, the, the hopping of the partons of IS, F of J, S, and then sum over all the S, right? So this is, this is, this is an exact identity up to a constant. You'll check the signs and etc., but that should be okay. Um, only in this Hilbert space, right? Only in this Hilbert space. So, so this is this is uh, this is now, of course, in the form we discussed yesterday. So this is like an A dagger A plus A A dagger, and so we know that we can use a complex field to um, to decouple it. So that's that's how you would do this part. Now, of course, for this object, you have a sign problem, right? So, so this is going to be a sign problem. But if you do it in this way, so, so this is work which has been done by Toshio essentially. Um, so, but if you do it in this way, it's, it's rather interesting because you can follow things which are done in, in, this, in this paper. In, in general, we say we have a sign problem, but essentially it's a phase problem because the determinant can have any phase, it's a complex object. So, um, so uh, generically, if, I, if I, put in, I put in a circle, then my phase in principle, my phase could be anywhere on this circle, right? This is, this is a, this is, so the phase can just go anywhere and it can fluctuate. Um, if I have no sign problem, that means that I've somehow been able to do some, found, found a trick so as to pin the phase here at zero, right? So that would be zero, that's an angle, right? It's an angle, angle zero. Now, um, so, so this can be done sometimes, but um, what, what, um, if, you, if you do your Monte Carlo in this formulation, what you see is that precisely in this formulation, you take a plus here and you take the plus here, et cetera. I mean, this is, you know, this is chemistry, but if you, just, if you take exactly the plus here, then what you will show in this paper is that um, you will pin the phase to zero or pi, which means that the determinant is or plus or minus one. And if you do that, then you will see that the, the, the average sign is actually not so bad so that you can go to temperatures which are for Kitayev type models, which are of the order beta J. Toshio, tell me if I'm correct. I'm always very ambitious, um, something like two or three. And actually this is not bad because, so this is something which you can reach for Kitayev type models, which are en vogue in, in quantum spin systems. You know, on, on what, what, how were the lattice Toshio's around? Were the lattices were 32 Toshio, is that correct? I don't know if Toshio is around or not. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Thank you, Toshio. So it's up to 32 lattices. And so, and so, um, so, so why is this nice? Well, because um, at least for the Kitaev models, I don't know for this model you have in mind, but so again, Toshio, help me if I'm correct. The J is of the orders of milli electron volts, right? So around 10 milli electron volt. So if I go to beta J equals three, I'm at, you know, at, you know, three or four milli electron volts, which is pretty low temperature, right? Which is of the, which of the order of 100 Kelvin or 50, 200 Kelvin. So you can, um, even if the, the key point is that you start with an effective model, which is at very low energy. And even if you go to beta J equals three, it seems to be not very cold on the scale of J, but on the scale of the experiment, it's actually pretty cool. So you can really compare your results with um, experiment. That's what Toshi did or tried, is, is, is doing. Um, and this is um, a thing which is a proof of principle. So I think it's, it would be very interesting. I have no idea how this would work 
um, how this idea would work for uh, the jaluzinski moria type interactions, but it's certainly something you can try, right? It's certainly something you can try. And if you want to do that, I'm quite sure that Toshio was willing to help you guys, right? And I never, did, did you try Toshio at one point or not? No, so, but so uh, jaluzinski moria type interaction is similar to the gamma term. So only That's, so. Huh. It's similar, it's similar, but it, it's, yeah, I, I agree. It's similar than the gamma term, but it's a bit different. Uh, symmetry, yeah, it, 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 but sim symmetry is different, completely yeah. different. And, and then, so we don't know so if so our trick yeah. so, that work or not. So. This would be something which, uh, which, would, which I would be very interested in. This would be new. I, I never tried that. Okay, and then, so that's it for this. And then of course, um, uh, these are just suggestions. And um, if you have another proposal, um, you, should, you should do your own problem, right? You should do your own stuff. That's always much funner to do your own stuff than to do the things that other people tell you you should try to do, right? Uh, and so, and so uh, if you have a problem, just tell us and we will try to see if it's feasible or not feasible, okay? Like most of the most of the problems I think are feasible. There's a sign problem, etc. Everything. Uh, the question will always be how bad is the sign problem? Okay, so um, I'm done with my project proposals, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions, comments. Okay, so. No questions, no comments. And I think uh, according to our plan, um, the project will start tomorrow, is that correct? Not quite. Uh, Today? Actually, actually, after after this talk, we have the last talk from on Alpha Basics, and then the people can already start um, to work on their projects. Okay, perfect. And there will be some breakout rooms for each project. Perfect. Yeah. Um, would you like to, to already have breakout rooms and uh, create the, the groups right now, Faka, uh, for the different, different projects, or I think it's too early? I think you can try to do this. You can do it. There's no, I'll stop the recording, first of all. <laughs>